Good morning and welcome to Heritage Church. On this first Sunday of Advent, we gather for worship, and it is the beginning of a new year in the Christian calendar, and we are so thankful for the opportunity to worship. In Advent, we celebrate the good news that Christ has come. We also long for the day of his return, when Christ will come again and make all things new. As we live in the space between celebration and longing, I invite you to join me in a responsive reading of an Advent liturgy. In ancient times, God's people were waiting for the coming of the promised Messiah. The Gospels record, record how that promised Messiah came as a baby. That child grew to be a man who was fully human and yet divine. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. We light this first Advent candle in celebration of the Christ who came. We look forward to that wonderful day when he will come again. Please join me in prayer to the one who has come and is coming again. God in heaven, how great it is that we can come to this place and celebrate the Jesus who came and who surely will come again. May this be a season filled with joy and meaning for us who put our hope in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was and who is and who is to come. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be with you. I invite you to stand and receive God's greeting. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and power of his spirit be with us all as we worship him. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing together meekness and majesty.
seated. For those of you who may not be aware of who this unfamiliar person up front is, let me just share for a moment with you. My name is Curry Pickard. I have been a pastor in the Reformed Church in America for since the day I was ordained back in 1974. I am, however, very familiar with Kalamazoo in that I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, graduated from Illinois High School. And that is, in fact, the connection I was able to make with your congregation a couple of years ago when we had our class reunion. And a uh, young man who now is about as young as I am by the name of Pat Shewey was there. He was a classmate of mine. And Pat said, you know, we'd love to have you come and preach sometime. And I said, yes. So we were here about a year and a half, two years ago, and Simon asked me to come back again, and so we're just delighted to be able to be here and, and share with you. We currently live in South Haven. I was serving in South Haven when we retired, and we thought, why move anywhere else? So uh, we're in South Haven and enjoy our retirement there. I'm still glad we are healthy enough to be in ministry. As we prepare our hearts for worship, we open and clean, cleanse our hearts. John the Baptist was sent by God to make ready God's people for Jesus' coming. In his preaching, he quoted words from Isaiah 40, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. As we prepare for his coming again, we continue in a time of confession, asking for God's forgiveness and grace to make straight our heart and life before him. Join me in a prayer of confession as we seek God's face together. Let us pray. Merciful God, always with us, always coming, we confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by so many things. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the Magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen. The good news of Advent is that Jesus has come. He has led the way through death that we may have life and is coming again to make all things new. Receive God's promise of forgiveness and grace today. In this assurance, we commit our lives to Christ's way of hope and peace. In that spirit, hear God's will for us as it is found in the words of Jesus from Mark 13. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Like a man going away, he leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. It's in that spirit that we bring God's word today. We're focusing on some very similar words from the 21st chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 25, thinking about the theme, when will God come? So let us hear God's word from Luke 21, beginning at verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. The powers of the heavens will be shaken, 
and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Let's pray. Lord God, you have spoken through your word. Speak now to our hearts. For we claim the promise that your word never goes forth void, but always accomplishes the purpose for which you send it out. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Twenty twenty has been, if nothing else, unique. Certainly one year ago, none of us could ever have predicted the barrage of events and circumstances that have occurred throughout this year. The arrival and spread of the COVID pandemic, the political upheaval, the rioting and violence in our streets denigrative, destructive incivility, the aggressive, hate-filled attacks, and so much more. And it has all led to, unfortunately, a, a breakdown in family and friend relationships. And it's easy to become, to become tired and weary, to be worn out. We long to be liberated from our brokenness to experience redemption for ourselves and for our relationships. We long for that perfected world. So I'm not surprised at how often I've heard a statement like, the end is near. Or heard questions like, when will God come again? We keep waiting for God to come, but we're not the first to wonder. The people in Luke's day wondered much the same thing, and so in his gospel, he included words of Jesus that we just read. And Luke was giving us, I think, first of all, a perspective of hope. The Son of Man is coming. Here his words again. There will be signs. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The brokenness of our world will end. Because the Son of Man is coming. Jesus has not made his last visit to our world. He alone is our only hope. And let's face it, hope is essential. It is essential to the human soul and to the human psyche. Without this hope, we lose our, our zest and our purpose and our motivation for living. Hope energizes the day. Imagine the young couple, married for several years, unable to bear children. Having applied for adoption, they've waited several years for everything to come together. And now, on this day, they await that phone call which will tell them if today is the time. Hope energizes the day. Hope prompts working and dreaming. Picture the young boy. Dribbling, shaking, and baking. I, I would do that, but I, I can't do that. But you, I think you can get the picture. He's dribbling, and he's shaking, and he's baking, and, and then he runs, and he jumps, stretching as high as he can to get as close as he can to that rim, all the while dreaming that he's LeBron. Hope prompts working and dreaming. Hope encourages discipline. Listen to a young girl who's just heard her favorite singer once again, and she knows that, that someday, someday she'll sound just like that. So she sings her songs over and over again, not always on pitch, not always with clear voice, but with great monotonous regularity. It's hope that encourages discipline. And hope kindles perseverance. Listen to the young husband and wife chat on the phone late at night. 
He still has two or three more hours of work before he can come home. They know it's the, the price to pay for starting their own business. But they hang on because they know that the day will come when the business will take off and he'll hire more employees and he can spend more time at home with his wife. It's hope that kindles perseverance. And hope inspires courage. Observe the young couple, glassy-eyed as they look into each other's eyes on their wedding day. Hopes of love and family and glory and success make this the greatest moment of their lives. And without that hope, they wouldn't even dare enter into this relationship. It's hope that inspires courage. Hope is essential. Remember when we were kids? When I was a kid, how you'd take a little magnifying glass and hold it in the sun and try to get a leaf to burn? Well, that's sort of what hope does. It focuses our energy like the magnifying glass, focuses the sun to channel the heat and begin the fire. It's hope that drives us and burns deep down inside of us. As someone said, it is hope that gets us out of bed in the morning and shapes the contours of our day. The truth is God's people have always been driven by hope. In Jeremiah's time, Israel was under siege again. They were in trouble. So Jeremiah recalled a promise that they had heard before, originally given in an earlier crisis, to assure them that God had not forgotten them. Jeremiah 33, verse 15. At that time I will choose a king, a righteous descendant of David. That king will do what is right and just throughout the land. The people of Judah and of Jerusalem will be rescued and will live in safety. The city will be called the Lord, our salvation. God will come to rescue, to save, and restore. And yet eventually Jerusalem tumbled. But then eventually Jesus came. Righteousness arrived in the flesh. Hopes again were raised. And now in Luke's time, Jesus is answering the people's similar question about the future. People want to know, when will God come in all of his fullness to restore his kingdom? And Jesus gave them an answer. But then Jesus died. Their hopes were again dashed. Their thinking confused. I think we know what they felt like. It appears our world is coming apart at the seams. Human power keeps failing. Nuclear weaponry again looms large. The moral and social realms are decaying. Political powers are polarized like never before. Brutality escalates daily. And you can add so many more things to the list. And most of us know the hopelessness personally as well. The doctor says, you have cancer. The pink slip carries your name. The officer standing in your doorway says, your husband, your wife, your child is dead. A loved one cries out, I have COVID. Or there's the signature on those divorce papers as the reality sinks in. You see the big red F on the final exam, and your heart sinks. You see the padlocks placed in the doors of businesses as rioters are intent on destroying it. I think we know what it is to teeter on the brink of hopelessness. And so we, too, ask the question, when will God come in all of his fullness to restore his kingdom? And Jesus gives us his answer. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory.
when the whole creation is in an uproar, he will come. He will come. Is the time near? All we can really say is it's nearer than it was yesterday. We really don't know. But since Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated on the throne, we too are driven by hope. We are driven by hope even in the midst of a world that is hopeless. The despair will come to an end. Degeneration is part of every generation. And so we must not lose ourselves in bemoaning the current state of affairs. Rather, let the times remind us we have a Savior. Let the times point us to Jesus. Jesus is asking for us to trust him. When the quakes shake and when the mud slides and hundreds are killed and thousands are homeless, when the grieving piles up, when our lives are in radical crisis, when our world is crashing, Jesus says, it's a sign. Something, someone greater is on the way. New life is coming. Redemption will occur. History has a goal, and the goal is that I will be Lord of all. See it as an opportunity to refocus on me. Trust me. Trust in Jesus is our perspective and our hope. Now it's interesting that where Matthew and Mark contain these same words of Jesus, they continue Jesus' teaching and dwell more on what Jesus said about particulars of the kinds of signs that could occur. But Luke gets personal. He deals with the now. It's as if he's saying now is more important than the future. So Luke offers us a position of hope that we can live with purpose. Verse 28, when these things begin to take place, and they have begun, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Stand up, get busy, live with a sense of urgency. The life of a disciple is not one of speculation and observation but of behavior. And so, Jesus gives us some instruction in, on how to behave. In the verses following what we read, we read these words. Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. And then he gave the application. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. First, we watch. The basic meaning of the word is to, to be aware of and know what's going on. As the budding of the trees indicate that summer is near, so the occurring of these signs simply indicates the Lord's return is near. But watch doesn't mean to stand and look around for all the signs. It means be awake, be alert, and don't get caught unprepared. It's easy, isn't it, to get weighted down with the cares and temptations of life? During difficult times, it's easy to give up. Without even realizing it, we begin to live like the unsaved world. So Jesus says, watch, resist temptations in order to be ready when Jesus returns. The important thing is that we believe and know that God is keeping his promises. His word will not fail. There's an old legend told about Satan and his demons. And they were actually having a, a Christmas party. And as the demonic guests were leaving, one of them said to Satan, Merry Christmas, Your Majesty. At that, Satan replied with a growl, Keep it merry, my friend. If they ever get serious about it, we'll all be in trouble. Be serious. Be always on the watch. 
The second behavior Jesus teaches is that we pray. We pray so that the coming of Jesus will not overwhelm us and the judgment will not overtake us. Hold on to the spiritual dimension of life. Prayer, at its noblest, is not about us bringing something to God, but bringing us closer to God. It's not getting something for ourselves. It's bringing something to Him. The psalmist penned it poignantly in Psalm 91. He will spread His wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or a city wall. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or arrows during the day. And you won't fear diseases that strike in the dark or sudden disaster at noon. You will not be harmed though thousands fall all around you. And with your own eyes you will see the punishment of the wicked. The Lord most high is your fortress. Run to him for safety. And no terrible disasters will strike you or your home. God will command his angels <clears throat> to protect you wherever you go. <clears throat> they will carry you in their arms. And you won't hurt your feet on the stones. Here and here alone lies our safety and our strength. Now our behavior of watching and praying puts us into an attitude of anticipation. Be always on the watch and pray that you will be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Anticipate standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. Hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the master's happiness. Watching, praying, being faithful here and now leads to the rich blessing in the hereafter. Our task is to keep standing until the day we stand before Jesus. Even after Jesus had ascended and gone to heaven, the early church, because of the persecution and crisis in which they found themselves, continued to ask the question, when will God come? So Peter in his epistle offers an answer as well. Second Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you, because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. What kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. While we wonder, when will God come? God wonders, when are you going to reach the point that I can? In the 1987 NCAA Basketball Regional Finals, LSU was leading Indiana by eight points with just a few minutes left in the game. As is often the case with the team in the lead, LSU began playing a different ball game. Even the television announcer pointed out that the LSU players were beginning to watch the clock rather than wholeheartedly continue to play the game. And as a result of the shift in focus, Indiana closed the gap, won the game by one point, and then went on to win the national championship. While Jesus calls us to be aware of the signs of the times, he clearly calls us to expand, to expand our energies in full active service. As we await Jesus' promised return, we are not so much to watch the clock, to look for the signs, as to be diligent servants during the time we have available. Jenny Lind, the late great opera star, used to sit alone in her dressing room moments before a performance. She'd let the stillness sink in, and then 
She would strike one clear, vibrant note and hold it for as long as she could. And then she would pray, Master, let me ring true tonight. Let me ring true as thou art true. Ring true. Ring true until he come. Ring true so that he come. Ring true. If you have never given Jesus permission to be Lord of your life, do it now and start to ring true. And if Jesus is already the Lord of your life, ring louder, clearer, stronger than ever before. For Jesus says, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Ring true until and so that he come. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. Help us, Lord, to cling to hope a sure and steadfast confidence that you are faithful and you will come again to restore and to redeem. But in the meantime, Lord, stir our hearts. Grant us courage to stand, to ring true, tolling of the bells we ring will be heard by many who will be drawn to you. This is the prayer that we raise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Certainly the truths preached this morning are not new. They're as old as the word itself, but they're also a rich part of the history of our faith. So this morning, as we respond to God's word, our profession of faith comes from Article 37 of the Belgic Confession. What will happen at the end of time? When the time appointed by the Lord is come, which is unknown to all creatures, and the number of the elect is complete. Our Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven, bodily and visibly, as he ascended, with great glory and majesty, to declare himself judge of the living and the dead. Will everyone see him when he comes? Yes, all human creatures will appear in person before the great judge. Men, women, children who have lived from the beginning until the end of the world. They will be summoned there by the voice of the archangel and by the sound of the divine trumpet. What about those who have already died? Will they miss it? All those who died before that time will be raised from the earth, their spirits being joined and united with their own bodies in which they live. What about those who are still alive? As for those who are still alive, they will not die like the others, but will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, from corruptible to incorruptible. Are you eager for this day? With good reason, the thought of this judgment is horrible and dreadful to wicked and evil people but it is very pleasant and a great comfort to the righteous and elect, since their total redemption will then be accomplished. We look forward to that great day with longing in order to enjoy fully the promises of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
It's with that hope that we can come confidently to our Lord in prayer. I've been asked to share two updates with you, and that is that Gene Bader and Farrell Stremler are both home and are recuperating, and we're grateful for that and continue to pray for their ongoing healing. Let us pray. Lord God, how grateful we are, especially in this season of the year, to remember that you came to earth and took upon yourself flesh to become one of us, that we could become like you. And we thank you for the sure and certain hope that you will come again with great power and glory and majesty. We thank you, Lord, that in between that which was and that which is to come, you have not left us like orphans, but you have come to us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you have gifted us. We thank you that you have taught us. We thank you that you have challenged us. We thank you that you have comforted us. We thank you for your presence in our lives. Even, perhaps especially in those times when we don't even give it a thought. You were there. You make your home in us. And we pause now to say thank you. We thank you for the community of your people that you call your body. We thank you for your church throughout the world. We thank you for your church here in this place. And we know, Lord, that even though the days have been different, building community is perhaps difficult. We recognize that your spirit who still moves among us, still connects us. And so we pray for one another. And even as we give you thanks for the news about Jean and Farrell, we continue to pray, Lord, that you will reach out and flood their bodies with healing. And each of us knows others, Lord, who need that healing touch. And even as we now quietly offer up their names to you, we know that you hear and you answer. And now we pray, Lord, that as we enter into this Advent season, it will truly be an adventure that you will help us lead the way to the celebration of your birth. In a world which needs the message now more than ever, Lord God, encourage us Show us the way. Do not let us off the hook. Do not let us cower in fear. But let us boldly proclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now as we go forth, to be the people that you have called us to be, may you receive the honor and the glory which is due to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. I've been asked to share uh, two or three announcements with you. First of all, to express a note of appreciation for your generous donation of groceries and financial gifts in support of the Kalamazoo loaves and fishes. They are appreciative of it. 
certainly a note of thanks to those who helped transform this worship space and get it ready for Advent and Christmas. How wonderful and peaceful it is to come in and be able to again sense the Spirit of the Lord in this very special way. I also have been asked to remind you that the offering this morning supports the mission and ministry of this congregation and the kingdom offering this morning to support the work of the International Campus Ministry and its mission of developing international influencers for Christ at Western Michigan University. And that offering will not be collected now, but it will be received at the doors as you exit the sanctuary. It's also a joy this morning for you to be able to welcome Jairo and Kelly Solano from Nicaragua. There's a short video that they want to show, and then they are going to be sharing with you. Good morning, Heritage. We are so excited to be here uh, after a few rescheduling <laughs> issues. We both were dealing with COVID, and there's been lots going on in our family, but it's just such a joy to be here this morning with all of you, and we just thank you. Um, we are Jairo and Kelly Solano. We are missionaries with the Christian Reformed Church serving in Nicaragua. We've been there for 11 years. We have both of our children here today. We have Sean, who is a freshman at Dort University, and we have Natasha, who is a sophomore studying at the Potter's House uh, Christian School while we're here on home service for six months. So it's just really a joy and an honor. Heritage has always had a very special place in my heart for a lot of reasons, but just especially in the last few years since you guys have come alongside and supported us We've been so thankful. We're thankful for your offering. We're thankful for your generosity, your support, your constant encouragement through emails and, um, and messages and um, notes. And we're just very grateful for you guys. Um, we are on home service, as I mentioned. We've been doing some fundraising. Um, 
that last slide showed just briefly um, how much of our support we rely on uh, through individual donors and through churches. And so we're here. Um, God has opened the doors for us to be here, even though it's kind of a crazy season <laughs> um, that we've been able to serve and just to be able to rest, to renew our energy, to reconnect with individuals and churches, and also to be able to increase our support. And that's part of our goal um, for why we're here. So Hyrule's going to talk a little bit about our ministries and what we're going to be doing when we go back in January. Yes, it's been definitely a great opportunity to come back and uh, share with uh, brothers and sisters and reconnect with churches and with family. Uh, like Kelly mentioned, we've been in Nicaragua for six, uh, for 11 years, and uh, we've planning, been planning for this time to come back, and, and we're grateful that the Lord allowed the opportunity to do it. But now we're ready to go back, ready to go back to continue with our ministry, to continue to be an extension of this church and all the churches that support us. Uh, so we can go back and share our faith, share the gospel with the people that we work with. Kelly, working with students at NCA from kindergarten, molding them, helping them to learn all those foundation that is needed to become uh, people that will be, uh, bring transformation to the country, uh, agents of transformation. And, and I working in the mountains with people from Ombachito, helping them to learn how to manage their resources and and how to improve the quality of life, being self-sufficient. and But all this we do, her work and my work, is based on one thing. It is an important foundation. It's based on the gospel, and that's what brings transformation. And that hope, that message was presented to us today, that's we, that hope turns into faith. That, you know, that we, what we believe, that we have experience, we can share with others, and that, that's what, that is what will bring transformation. It's not governments, it's not money, it's not... Uh, it is the, the, the faith in, in Christ and following the Lord that will help. We're going back to a Nicaragua that's been under a lot of struggle. Uh, two years ago, we had a serious political uh, uh, unrest that caused uh, the totally collapse of the um, uh, tourist, uh, tourist industry, which is around 60% of the uh, income of Nicaragua of Nicaragua. And after that, we get COVID, so we still, the country is not receiving uh, tourists, so the economy continues to be bad. And after that, we get hit just in this month of January, of, I'm sorry, of uh, November, by two hurricanes. We devastated all crops, just basically corn and uh, beans and plantains. And so it's a country that's going through a lot. And the more reason we need to go back to continue to help and, and, and share our faith and help the farmers to improve the quality of life and also with that hope, you know, that uh, the Lord will use us, will continue to use you and, and use us so we can become uh, an extension and, and share the gospel with people in Nicaragua. Uh, we feel really uh, excited and, and super blessed that we've been allowed this opportunity. You know, the scripture says, Blessed are the feet of those who go and share. And also it says, blessed are those who send those uh, to share the gospel because it's not just uh, the effort of one person. So we want to say thank you, and we want to um, uh, yeah, give all glory to God for everything he's allowing us to do. I just want to echo that, too. Thank you so much for allowing us to serve in Nicaragua and helping us, and we represent you whenever we share the gospel with a kindergartner or with someone in the mountain community, um, we're representing you and the churches here in, in North America. So we're very thankful for that. Um, we, our plan is to return to Nicaragua in January. We have raised a, a fourth of our individual, um, of our support for our family. And out of that support comes the money for Jairo to do his mission work in, in Mobachito. We are also very excited God has presented the opportunity for us to purchase land. I think three or four years ago, we purchased some land in um, Nicaragua with the help of some investors in Grand Rapids. And now we're hoping to build a house for our family. And so we have another opportunity. Um, we've raised half of the money that we need. Um, our goal was 50000 and we've gotten half of that. And I say raised, but it's investors. Um, and then we're also just hoping and praying so if you could pray alongside with us for um, a few more investors to step 
uh, forward and be able to help us so that we can hopefully build our house this year. That's another really exciting thing. So God is doing big things. We're going to wrap it up by saying thank you again. May God bless your congregation. We think of you often, and we pray for you as well. And uh, thank you for having us here this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks. Let's offer a prayer for the Solano. Lord God, you have chosen to use them in a very special way. And we give you thanks for their life and for their ministry. We thank you for this time that they can be here. We pray that you will touch hearts, that their support will be garnered and gathered for their ministry and for the building of their home. We pray that you will keep them safe, that you will give them strength and energy for the remainder of their time here and safety as they return home. And we pray for, we pray for Nicaragua. Lord, we ask that you would do a mighty work. While it's difficult now, it's an opportunity and an open door for the gospel of Jesus Christ to take hold as never before. So empower the Solano. Empower the church. May your Holy Spirit revive the work and restore your kingdom. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and receive the benediction and then remain standing for the closing hymn. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until you come to stand before him in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.